the Old Time Gospel Hour, Program 500, Regular Version. From the auditorium of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, the Faith Partners and Friends present Jerry Falwell and the Old Time Gospel Hour, celebrating 25 years of Christian ministry. Thank you. Be seated. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. We all are witnesses to the fact that he rose from the dead because we have met the living Christ. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, he lives within your heart. Today I'm speaking from Proverbs chapter 4, the fourth chapter of Proverbs as we teach and preach right through the 31 chapters of the Proverbs in these old-time gospel hour services. We're going to have a great time today, some wonderful music about our risen Lord, all prepared for you and the millions who are watching by television. When I was converted 30 years ago, I did not own a Bible. The next day after my conversion, January 20th, 1952, my pastor suggested I go down to J.P. Bell Company here in Lynchburg, Virginia and purchase a King James Version of the Bible. I did that. And uh, I've been teaching and preaching from one and reading and memorizing from one all these 30 years. I have in this slipcover two King James Bibles. One of them is 371 years older than the other one. This is a brand new one. Nobody in the world has this one yet. This one happens to be the fifth edition, the fifth revision of the King James Bible, and it's still coming off the printing presses now. We have, from the publishers, gotten a promise of the first 5,000 copies just for a collector's edition for our special friends of the Old Time Gospel Hour. This one is the 1611 edition. It's a replica of the actual 1611 King James Bible, 371 years between the 1611 and the 1982 uh, edition, and we have put them in a slipcover. We have 5,000 copies of each for 5,000 special friends, and I hope that some of those friends are in this building right now, and we'll say more about that later. We'll tell you how you can get them. Right now, Mr. Mac Evans is coming to sing about Calvary, that hill, that location. I've been there many times. I've been to Calvary geographically. I've been to Calvary spiritually. Mr. Mike Evans. One day God stepped out into nothing, spoke his creative words, let there be light, and there was. He made the heavens and the earth and worlds and galaxies beyond. With his great hand, he scooped out the canyons, and with his fingers, he traced courses for the rivers. He made the mountains to stand so tall and still. But then my mind's eye goes back to that day on creation's morning after God had made all of that. How that possibly a slight trace of sadness must have shown in his eye that day as he made a small lonely hill. Then he said, let us make man in our image and give him dominion over all. We'll walk together in the cool of the evening and I'll help him if he should fall. Because he really wants to 
and to walk with me by his own will. But then a slight trace of sadness came back into his eye as he looked toward that small lonely hill. Then late one evening, God came to the garden. Adam, 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 wherefore art thou? The birds hush their singing in the garden. There was silence. Oh, folks, you could sense it. For something had died. But God said, I really love him, and I won't let him go. From that small lonely hill. And now I thank God. Well, I thank Him for the mountains. Oh, yes, and I praise Him for the valleys. And it is heavens how my heart always thrills. Do you know that day of days? But at last we enter that holy city. Oh, yes, that city where the saints all praise him. I want to thank him for that small, lonely hill. Oh, I want to thank Jesus for Calvary's hill. There are about nine million persons, maybe more than that, wearing the Jesus First lapel pin. You see them everywhere. But lately, because of the pro-life movement and the anti-abortion movement in this country, the people who believe that abortion is the national sin of America, you're beginning to see another lapel pin that uh, many people are wearing right under the Jesus First lapel pin. Others are wearing it all alone. But they're wearing it as a testimony to their conviction that life is precious. Unborn life as well as born life is precious to God. And they believe the commandment, thou shalt not kill. That little lapel pen that the pro-life movement is using now by the thousands is called the Precious Feet Lapel Pen. This is one right here. The Precious Feet Lapel Pen. This is about the identical size and shape of the feet of a little baby in its mother's womb 10 weeks after conception. It's just a way to get someone to ask, what are those little feet? And as you mentioned what those little feet are, those little feet, the precious feet lapel pen, represent the feet of a living child in its mother's womb, precious and alive and deserving the fundamental right to survive. I'd like to ask you to call me. That's a toll-free number on the screen, 1-800-446-5000. Request the Precious Feet lapel pen. I'll send you two of them, one for you, one for another member of your family, and then wear the pen everywhere. Just dial the toll-free number, and one of the Liberty Baptist College students or one of our, our staff members will answer the call. It's a free call, and the pens are free. Ask for the Precious Feet lapel pen. If you live in Virginia, Hawaii, Alaska, or Canada, that number will not work. 
we'll ask you to write to us and ask for the Precious Feet lapel pin. And whether you live in the USA or Canada, write and we'll send them to you immediately. They're free. You'll get two of them, and we hope that all over the country there'll be those persons who are saying, I believe in the preciousness of human life. 1-800-446-5000. Request the Precious Feet lapel pin. The Sounds of Liberty and Don Norman are going to sing about that risen Christ who three days after his crucifixion, which Mac Evans has just sung about, three days later, as it dawned upon the first day of the week, Sunday, they came to the tomb and found it was empty. And they were told, He is not here, for He is risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Jesus, the resurrection. of guilt and shame but then Jesus came and loosed my shackles no more sin can freely Thank you, Don. Sounds of Liberty. Two weeks ago, I asked you to be one of 5,000 persons participating in a miracle in May on behalf of the Old Time Gospel Hour television radio network. We are at this time, because of the heavy snowstorms and the retarded mail 
uh, flow during the winter and inflation. We're in the process of eliminating some television and radio stations from our network. I don't want to do it. Thousands of people are coming to know Christ. So we ask God to give us 5,000 friends during the month of May. I know most of you are saying, Jerry, I could never give $1,000, but you can pray, and I hope every one of you will pray. But you may be one of those persons who could sacrificially invest $1,000 in the Old Time Gospel Hour. And if you wish, you may make a pledge and give $100 a month for the next 10 months, any way you want to do it. Some people have said, I can't give it all at once. Could I pledge? Yes, you can. There's a toll-free number on your screen right now. Pick up your telephone. Call me. Make your pledge. You'll be giving $100 a month for the next 10 months. You'll become a part of a 5,000-person miracle, one of 5,000 persons who, in our appreciation for what you've done, will receive these two King James Bibles. One of them is 371 years older than the other in the original. This is the brand new one. This one here is uh, the 1982 fifth revision. It's not off the presses yet. Thomas Nelson Publishing Company agreed to give us the first 5,000 copies for our special donors. And it will be numbered in your name, and I'll be signing it to you. It's in genuine leather cover. And so is this one. This one is the 1611 edition. It's a replica, of course, but Thomas Nelson Company had the, one of the original 1611 Bibles, and they're printing us 5,000 copies of that one also. So these two Bibles will be placed in this slipcover, and this beautiful brand new one will be numbered, and uh, it will have your name in it, and I'll be signing it to you. It's a collector's edition. And this one, the 1611 edition, I think you'll like to compare the two and see what changes there have been. May I say the scholars who have done this brand new fifth revision were from schools like Tennessee Temple University, Moody Bible Institute, our own Liberty Baptist College. And I think that you'll appreciate the correctness and the trueness to the original text. I want you to have this. I think you'll be glad you got them. But more importantly, you'll be helping us keep this program on this station and on all 400 television stations and 500 radio stations. Thousands of souls are coming to know the Lord because of this ministry. Will you help me? Will you be one of 5,000 persons in a May miracle? I know only a handful looking in can do this. But you could either give it all at one time, made payable to Old Time Gospel Hour. It's tax deductible, of course. Or you can give $100 monthly for 10 months, however you want to do it. Just pick up your telephone right now, call our toll-free number, and tell one of our operators, I want to be a part of the May miracle. I'm pledging $1,000. Then give it any way you want, $100 a month for 10 months or all at once, however. Immediately, I will inform the Thomas Nelson Company to begin hand-tooling these two Bibles for you. They're going to be hand-tooled in genuine leather, numbered, your name inscribed, and I'll be signing it to you autographing it to you. It will be put on a slip cover. It'll take a number of weeks to have it made for you, but it will go into production as quickly as I get your telephone call. I need your help, and I want you to be one of 5,000 people who will be the only 5,000 in the world ever to have these copies of the 1611 and the 1982 editions of the King James Bible. Now remember, the new one is still on the presses now. And as soon as you make the phone call, making your pledge or however, we'll inform Thomas Nelson Company. They'll begin hand-tooling the Bibles for you. And in a matter of weeks, you'll have them. And we need your help. If you live in Virginia, Hawaii, Alaska, or Canada, that toll-free number doesn't work. You need to write me here in Lynchburg, Virginia, and say, Jerry, I'll be one of them. I'll help you. I'll see this program stays on the air. If you live in Canada, it's Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario. Both of the addresses are on the screen. I hope to hear from no less than 5,000 friends, but that is the limit, so contact me immediately. Several months ago, we had a little four-year-old boy, John DeHass, saying he's alive. Well, we have a young man slightly older than four, Mr. Glenn Litke, who's going to sing it today, along with the concert choir from Liberty Baptist College, parts of it, and the Old Time Gospel Hour Orchestra. It's fantastic. I mean, if you don't get blessed by this one, your blesser's broken. 
He is alive. He walked up out of that grave. He's alive. Mr. Glenn Lidke, the concert choir, and the old-time gospel hour orchestra led by Mr. Ray Losey. Gates and doors were barred, and all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow, and half in fear of the day, would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle, and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window, looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary, so I went down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said, they've moved him in the night and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away and now his body isn't there. We both ran toward the garden, then John ran on ahead. We found the stone and the empty tomb just the way that Mary said. But the winding sheet they wrapped him in was just an empty shell. And how or where they take it in was more than I could tell. Something strange had happened there. Just what I didn't know. John believed a miracle. I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high Cause I'd seen them crucify him And I saw him die Back inside the house again The guilt and anguish came Everything I promised him Just added to my shame When at last it came the choices I denied I knew his name I denied I knew his name even if he was alive, it would be the same. Suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. The light came from everywhere, drove shadows from the room. Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide, and I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried. me to my feet, and as I looked into his eyes, love was shining out from them like sunlight from the skies. Guilt and my confusion disappeared in sweet release. Every fear I ever had just melted into peace.
Amen. How beautiful. So beautiful. Before going into Proverbs 4, I want to share a burden with you, a burden that's on my heart for the little children of Haiti. Three weeks ago, I took you there. You met little Marie. Oh, how bright, how sweet, how radiant she is, age four, attending one of the Christian kindergartens we're helping to support there. She has Christian parents. She's in a good Bible-believing church. She's one of 25 or 30,000 children we're helping in Haiti. I'm glad for her, but there are hundreds of thousands who don't have the privileges that she's had. I was asking a missionary while there three weeks ago, what's the difference between the brightness and the, and the, and the quickness and the alertness and the irradiance of, of little Marie, for example, and the other children I've met here? And the answer shocked me. Here was the answer the missionary gave me. Marie has had at least one glass of milk per day for all of her life. And that has prevented a deterioration of her brain. Malnutrition not only destroys the body, but the brain as well. And that so stunned me that I came home determined to somehow provide milk for more children in Haiti. They don't have it. It's not available to them. I asked our staff here to find out what we could get powdered milk for, how we could get it transported to Haiti. Could we get it distributed through the missionaries to the children? All that's been done. We have learned that it takes about 18 pounds of powdered milk to feed each child one glass, eight ounce glass of milk per day for one year. For example, here, here's 18 pounds of powdered milk. Did you know for $1.50 with the provision we uh, have made for getting the milk, we have some people we're going to see to it. We get it either free or cheaply. The transportation is about the only cost. For a dollar and fifty cent, we can feed one child for one year every day an eight ounce glass of milk. Would you help me? I would like to assume the goal of taking care of fifty thousand Haitian children for one year a glass of milk every day. Ten children will cost you fifteen dollars. Would you provide 10 children an eight-ounce glass of milk every day for a year with a $15 gift? You may want to take on two or three or five children. Maybe you just want to take on one child, a dollar and a half. I don't know. I'm not suggesting how much. But I wish you'd write to me here in Lynchburg, Virginia and say, Jerry, I'm underwriting one child or 10 or 20 or 50 children. 10 children, I remind you, can be fed a glass of milk, an eight-ounce glass of milk each day for a year. And that's what this amounts to right here. This is the powdered milk necessary to give a glass of milk once a day to a child for 365 days, 18 pounds. You can do that for a dollar and a half for one child. Ten children is $15. Do you have that clearly? Would you help me do it? I'd like to take on 50,000 children for a year. Write to me here in Lynchburg, Virginia, and have a part in it. The address in Lynchburg and in Canada is on the screen right now. Let's provide powdered milk for 50,000 children. And you adopt, you take on as many children as you can for an eight ounce glass of milk per day for 365 days. I think God will bless us for doing it. Now let us open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter four. Beginning with verse one, Reading through verse 27, page 976 in your Faith Partner Study Bible. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my word. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. 
She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened or hindered. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward or a deceitful mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of this blessed book, the Bible. We especially are grateful for the Proverbs that teach us successful living, that teach us how to get into the will of God and live there. Thank you for these words that teach us how to build great and solid and stable families, churches, and even a nation. In Jesus' name, amen. The first several chapters of the book of Proverbs are letters from a father to his son. Words of instruction from the father to the children on how to live successfully. We have from the Proverbs defined the word success as getting into the will of God as early as possible in life and staying there for as long as possible. That is success. It may not involve riches, prestige, fame, power, but it certainly involves fulfillment and joy and happiness. Success getting into the will of God as early in life as possible and living there as long as possible. One of the key words, according to verse 7, the principal thing in the entire book of Proverbs is wisdom. Wisdom, which in the Proverbs means seeing things from God's point of view, seeing things from God's perspective. So we begin chapter 4, verse 1, with these words, Hear, ye children, the instruction of of a father. I believe that the future of America has always been, is now, and ever shall be in the hands of the fathers. What a responsibility we husbands and fathers have. In this day of the feminist movement, we are attempting to digress from the biblical responsibility that God has put upon the husband and the father to build great and solid and stable and spiritual families. Now that is not to say that the mother doesn't play a role, a very important role. But dad, we can never shift onto the shoulders of mom the responsibilities that God has put upon our shoulders. We are not to be dictators in the homes, but we are to be spiritual leaders in our homes. We are to set the example. And here we have a two-way street. First of all, the children have an obligation to listen to their parents. If you want to please God, young man, young lady, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. When you hear about today's movement of children's rights, be careful. Of course, we all abhor child abuse. Any intelligent person stands in violent opposition to child abuse. Men and women who beat on little children and misuse and abuse little children are less than human beings. So we'll dismiss that immediately. That does not mean we throw the baby out with a wash. Dad still has the responsibility to give instruction and leadership to children 
And children have the responsibility to obey their parents in the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with corporal punishment. In case you don't know what that is, that's applying the pressure to the north end going south. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, there's something wrong with a family that doesn't use that. And the children who grow up to be normal, well-adjusted adults are those who had a few fingerprints in uh, the, the southerly part at times. That's God's way of training men and women, building godliness and character into young people. Well, children, we have in every child the responsibility to obey parents. Parents, we have the obligation to teach them properly and set the right example before them. He says in verse 2, I give you good doctrine. Dad, are you giving your children good doctrine? The word doctrine means teaching. Are you giving good teaching to your family? Are you teaching your children what the real priorities in life are? What's the priority in your family? I mean, besides your love for God and devotion to God. First of all, the real priority in any family under God is love for each other in that family. Dr. Naramore, the great Christian psychologist, said, what shall it profit a preacher if he saved the whole world and lose his own children? My wife and I have three children. They're now all three teenagers, so you know we need prayer. 19, 17, and 15. Uh, my number one priority, my wife's number one priority, our priority under God is to love, care for, and teach good doctrine to those children. A year from now, 10 years from now, they will either be my delight or my great heartbreak. One of the two. Now, Dad, that's a fact in your house too. Those children, 10 years, 15 years from now, will either be your great delight or your great heartbreak. Teach them good doctrine. Teach them a love for the Word of God. Teach them the inerrancy of Scripture. Teach them a love for Jesus. Teach them the doctrines of the Bible, the virgin birth of Christ, the deity of the Lord Jesus, the fact that there's a real heaven where we're going to spend eternity one day, where that forever family of God will gather into the eternal abode. Teach them that there's a real hell and that we should witness to people, lead them to Christ to keep them out of hell. Teach them the importance of their testimony. Teach them good doctrine. Don't teach them not to drink. Do more than that. Teach them not to drink and set the right example before them. Alcoholic beverages? Well, you say, now, I don't see anything wrong with, with, with sociable drinking or social drinking. You know, there's a rule, there's a biblical standard by which you can determine everything you're doing. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all to the glory of God. Is it possible for you to turn up a Miller low life to the glory of God? Think about that. Is it possible for you with a Slitz, a Budweiser, or some of the booze of today's world? What's some of the names, Don? Uh, <laughs> is, it possible, is it possible for you to do that to the glory of God? Can you really walk into that den of iniquity and order one and drink it and say to everybody in the bar, I am doing this to the glory of God? If you can, go ahead. You know, I just happen to think, mom and dad, that we not only have the obligation to tell our children what is right, but to live what is right in front of our children so that they have a living example of what you're teaching. And boy, I think it's wonderful when you not only have a Christian home and family, but you have a good Bible-believing, Christ-exalting, soul-winning local church that on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night reinforces in the lives of the children what mom and dad are trying to nail down during the week. In the, in, in the mouths of two or more witnesses, let everything be established. And when you have a good, solid Christian home for your family and a good Bible-believing, Christ-exalting church, uh, you've got a terrific combination because they get it at home and they get the same thing at church. Now, some of you dear people belong to a a liberal religious morgue where they long since stopped preaching the Bible. And I know what you're thinking. Uh, at one time they did preach the Bible. They've gone liberal now, but grandmother's buried in the backyard. If grandmother could get out, she would. 
You have no right nor reason to stay in that kind of a place. If they're not honoring Christ and His Word, find yourself a good Bible-preaching church in that town and join it. Now the question you have is, how can I find a good Bible-believing church? Usually it's the one that's being criticized the most. If you'll just listen down to the beauty parlor or the barber shop, the one that's really getting knocked, I'd check it out. It's probably doing a good job. Nobody bothers. You know, Satan, if you were Satan, you'd do just what he does. You'd leave the cemeteries alone. Don't worry about the religious morgues where nothing's happening. You get down where those churches are getting people saved and putting homes back together and bust it up if you possibly can. That's your problem, those good Bible-believing churches. There's a third leg on the tripod. That's the Christian school. I was speaking in a religious gathering of a sort some time ago. A lot of people there, a lot of preachers. The gentleman who spoke just in front of me spent a good bit of his time talking about or against Christian schools. He called them religious hothouses. He said, we're taking children out of the realities of life, out of the mainstream, and putting them in hothouses, an unreal world. And they're going to grow up maladjusted and unprepared for real life. Well, I've been a part of planning or helping to plant thousands of those hothouses, those Christian schools, from kindergarten right through grade 12. Because, by the way, our little children are not missionaries. They are our siblings. They are our children for whom we are responsible. And it's our business first to make men and women of God, of God out of them and then to send them into the world. And by the way, they'll become very much aware of the rest of the world just by living in the community and walking up and down the streets day and night and by television and what uh, part of the world they hear about in their own church. I mean, they'll really be adjusted to real life. It is amazing how adjusted young men and young ladies are who've been through Christian schools. They are ready for it academically and ready for it sociolo sociologically, psych uh, psychologically. They're all ready, physically as well. When you have a good Christian school with 30 hours a week, your sons and daughters are listening to godly school teachers teach science from the biblical perspective. And by the way, this week, the State Board of Education in Virginia approved Liberty Baptist College biology graduates for uh, teacher certification teaching biblical creation. Have you ever heard such a terrible thing? You can actually go in a public school and say you believe the Bible and, and be certified to do it. Well, the, God bless the State Board of Education. Uh, one dear brother from another university on the committee, it was an eight to one vote, was so afraid that we would pervert all of uh, the educational world by saying we believe the Bible. But at the same time, uh, we need to train our young people up in, in the classrooms where they're under godly teachers, in the church where they're under godly preachers, and in the home where they're under godly parents. And if you've got your sons and daughters in that kind of environment, I want to tell you, you're going to produce a well-adjusted, well-rounded, fit-for-real-life young people, young men and young ladies. Hear ye children the instruction of a father. Speaking of those good churches, Bible-believing churches, did you, did you hear the news last week that the National Council of Churches is considering accepting the Metropolitan Community Church into its fellowship. Hey, do you know what the Metropolitan Community Church is? It's the gay church in America. They're around various places. And they're considering, at least they've applied for acceptance into the National Council of Churches. I was asking a press conference in Minneapolis the other night, what do you think about that? I said, well, I expect they'll get accepted. <laughs> I don't know why they wouldn't. They've accepted everything else. Uh, you know, the NCC has a talent of being on the wrong side of everything. Now, God bless them. I, I, you know, I know they think I'm nuts, but it's mutual. <laughs> I, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we at least, you know, the peace movement. They're in the, into this so-called peace movement. I'm for peace, too. You know the Soviets are for peace? P-I-E-C-E, -E, a piece of this and a piece of that. They want a little bit of everything. Right now, it's El Salvador. And we have our, our dear religious brethren who want a nuclear freeze. Freeze everything. That's great. We've been frozen for a number of years already. The idea is if we will disarm and we will uh, lay down our guns and disarm our nation, the Soviets, who are wonderful people, 
uh, the, the Soviet government will reciprocate and follow suit and they will disarm too. Well, if you believe that, I got a bridge I want to sell you. <laughs> On time. I'll give you any terms you want. Of course, everybody's against war. But how naive can you get? There was a letter in the, to the forum, the press, the locally, local newspapers this week. Dr. Jan Lynn, who's a very fine gentleman, is a chaplain here at Lynchburg College, uh, supporting that so-called peace movement. Well, I want to say to you that I support any peace movement that uh, has inspection and safeguards and so th we can absolutely be sure that the Soviets and the Red Chinese and everybody else is doing what we're doing and that we are not being locked into inferiority. But I want to say to you at this point in time, I support President Reagan's plan 1,000%. Why? Because I want my children to grow up in the free America that I have enjoyed. And God bless the president for having the backbone to stand up against some of those churchmen who make you seem to be a warmonger when you're not for throwing in the towel and say, hey, we can't uh, whip you, so we'll join you. I say, if we can't whip you, let's try. <laughs> Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. Let's build great families. Let's build great churches. Let's build great Christian schools. Let's put up some hot houses and train some hot Christians and send them out into a cold world and have a Holy Ghost revival in the process. Well, let's go on now. Verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. There's always a danger after having gotten close to the Lord and living for God. When God blesses you and enlarges your tent to forget who did it for you. Declension, spiritual declension. The word in the Old Testament is backsliding. In the New Testament, we talk about the prodigal son. Whatever you call it, when a child of God who's been blessed of God and who has loved the Lord turns his back on God and, and the words of God decline in his heart, he's getting in serious trouble. You know, we only have today promised. None of us have tomorrow promised. This is the day the Lord has made. And I hope I live to be as old as Dr. Lakin and as mean as he is at 81. Uh, I hope that God allows me to have health and strength and all the rest. I'm 48 now, but the facts are that the odds are against it. But if the Lord lets me live that long, I want to live every day for him. And if God takes me home today, I want that not one day will have been wasted with his words declining in my heart. I want them growing and increasing in my heart. Verse 7 says wisdom is the principal thing. Seeing things from God's point of view, that's the principal thing. The kids would say it this way, wisdom is the mainest thing. Wisdom is the mainest thing. Get to know divine understanding. Get to know God's point of view on every issue. And what I said a little earlier, apply it in your whole lifestyle. Had a youngster say something to me the other day about smoking. Uh, he said, preacher, uh, smoking won't send you to hell. The temptation was to say, no, it'll, make, but it'll just make you smell like you've been there. But I didn't. I, um, the smoking won't send you to hell, he said. I said, no, it won't. And this was a Christian kid. He said, well, what's wrong with it? I said, why are you asking me about it? Why are you even taking your time and mine to ask me about it? If you don't have a question mark down there, I said, the fact is, and a good rule of thumb for Christian behavior is, when in doubt, leave it out. Now you look at Jerry Falwell, I'll look at you for a moment. Would you respect me as much if I'd come in the side door and stood there before I came in the pulpit and ducked one out and dropped it over there in the container? And well, why, of course not. Look at that hypocrite up there in the pulpit. Well, hey, if I'm a hypocrite for doing it, what about you? There are no two standards for preachers and laymen. I know it's getting hot back there now. But uh, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is that as a child of God, indwelt by the living Christ and your body, the temple of God, wisdom is the principal thing. You get to seeing things from divine perspective and you won't be thinking about what's good for me, but rather what's good for God. What's best for God? What, what, what is God most glorified in? And whatever glorifies him the most, that's the best thing to do. I move along hurriedly. Verse 13, 
take fast hold of instruction. That means a firm grip on good doctrine, good teaching. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Young people, this means you learn as much as you can. Don't attend church occasionally when it's nice to do it. I mean, you attend church every time you can. Attend Sunday schools, get into seminars, get in workshops, get around good Christians, listen, try to learn everything you can. And while you're doing that, get a firm grip on it and apply it in your life for the rest of your days. Because according to verse 13, this is your life. And then, then he goes on to say, verse 16, no, verses uh, 14 through 16, enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. To summarize that, that means don't run with the wrong crowd. Don't run with, run with the wrong crowd. One old preacher said, if you lie down with the dogs, you get up with the fleas. You run with people who are living wrong lives, and you pay a price for it. I would urge you, I would urge Christian kids to always marry a Christian spouse. If you're going into partnership in business, get into partnership with a child of God. Don't be unequally yoked together. You'll pay the price for it down the road. I have a friend who went into business, the restaurant business. He's a wonderful Christian. Went in half and half with an unsaved man. He was a nice man, a good man. But the economics of the situation demanded a decision later on beer and wine in the restaurant. And the only way out was he either had to buy his partner out or be bought out or go along with the beer and wine license, which violated his conscience. He couldn't afford to buy him out, so he had to go along. And there he was, part owner of a business that became a joint. And finally, because of his Christian conscience, he took a terrible financial beating. It almost put him in bankruptcy. You say he did the right thing? Yes, he did. But he wouldn't have had to go through that if he hadn't violated the Word of God, which says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, we have all these principles in the Word of God that prevent us from falling into these snares. doesn't mean you're any better than anybody else, but it means if you live right and live by the Word of God, young people, you won't have to go through those storms. And then, verse 18, the path of the just, the man of God who's walking God's way, is as the shining light that shineth more and more under the perfect day. You get more and more light as you go along. If you're following the Word of God, living in prayer, the Spirit of God will give you more light, more direction, more guidance every day. And every day with the Lord Jesus is better than the day before. Paul said, though the outward man perish, that is, these old bodies begin to fade, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Vinegar Ben Mizell is here today. Put the camera Roy, if you will, on that good-looking man back there on the aisle. I want you to stand, Vinegar Ben. This guy used to pitch for the, for the uh, Cardinals and then for the Pirates. He says he can still throw the ball just as hard as he ever did. It just takes longer to get there. God bless you, Vinegar Ben. He was a congressman as well. I can do anything I could do 30 years ago for 30 seconds. The fact is, whether you like it or not, you divine healers, I'm, I'm for you and all that stuff, but I just don't believe what you're doing. Divine healing. I've heard, I've heard them say that uh, whenever you're sick, that's a sign you're out of the will of God. Hey, we're all sick. You cannot do this year what you could do last year. You know why I have to put these blooming things on? I can't see the page, that's why. <laughs> and seven, eight years ago, I could read it back there at the television set. Everything's wearing out. Nothing works as good as it used to. And you just can't get replacement parts because we're all sick and we're all going downhill. But thank God, Christ in us is getting stronger all the time. And that Lord Jesus in us, that new nature, we can be stronger at 80 than we were at 40. That's the Christian life. The bright, that, that light is shining brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. And finally, he tells us how to use our body. Verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence. The first thing is keep your heart pure. Be very careful what you feed into your heart. Secondly, put away, verse 24, from thee a froward or deceitful mouth. Keep your mouth clean. Don't get in the slang and gutter language. Number three, verse 25, let thine eyes look as the young people say it right on. And let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Look upward and onward. Keep going on by faith. And finally, verse 26, ponder the path of thy feet. And let all thy ways be established. Walk in the ways of the Lord. 
This is the book for successful living. It's worked for thousands of years. It'll work for you in 1982. Let's bow our heads in prayer. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, how many here will say, Pastor, thank God I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ lives in my heart. I'm saved and I know it. If I die today, I'm as sure for heaven as if I were already there. Saved for sure forever and thankful to God. Would you raise your hand, please, right now? God bless every one of you. With our heads bowed now, if you couldn't lift your hand a moment ago, if maybe you don't know the Lord as your Savior, or you are a Christian, but you're not living for Him as you once did, and you'll say, Jerry, pray for me. I need your prayers. I have a spiritual need in my life. Just lift your hand right now, high enough, long enough for me to see it. God bless every one of you. God bless you. Heads are bowed. There in the pew about the television set, would you just bow your head right now and if you need Jesus as your Savior, believing He died for you on the cross, was buried, rose again, right now, invite Jesus into your heart. Trust Him as your Savior. And write me a letter. I'll send you a free copy of my booklet, How to Get Started Right, the same material we give these who walk down the aisles in this service. If you still have a question about your salvation, give me your telephone number. J.O. Grooms and our soul winning pastors will call you at our expense and explain to you the plan of salvation. And if you happen to have a prayer request, you write me. I'll answer you personally. We'll pray for you by need, by name. If you want counseling, there's a prayer hotline. Someone there 24 hours a day to help you. If you're deaf, there's a call, a TTY, a free number for you. God loves you. Let us help you. Let's stand, please, to pray. Our Heavenly Father, help men and women, boys and girls, to do now what they'll be glad they've done when they stand in your presence one day. Don't let anybody die and go to hell who heard the message. But may the blood of Jesus cleanse them from every sin right now. For Christ's sake I pray, amen. While our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, our pastors are here at the front to meet you. From the balconies, from the main floor, if you need Christ as your Savior, I want you to step out and come down here and tell one of the preachers, go to a private prayer room where with an open Bible, somebody will point you to the Lord. If you need to rededicate your life, just come. If you want to pray here at this altar or in a private prayer room, you come. The pastors will help you. If you want to join our church, come. We invite you into our fellowship. If you just want to rededicate your life, come. If God's calling you to the ministry, young people, come. While we sing right now, come to the risen Christ. Let him meet your need. While we come, while we sing, come on. You have been watching the Old Time Gospel Hour originating from the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. To become a faith partner and receive this beautiful faith partner Bible, call toll-free 1-800-446-5000 for complete information. Once again, that free number is 1-800-446-5000. Now, this is John Corrigan inviting you to join us next week for another telecast of the Old Time Gospel Hour. And until then, may God richly bless you, is our prayer. This has been a presentation of the Liberty Broadcasting System.